Assalamu alaikum brothers. Um, Sri Yusuf has asked me to record uh, a little comment on the issue of maturity. He was specific that he wanted to speak about the maturity of men, who wanted me to speak about the maturity of men, but I'd like to examine the issue of uh, maturation sort of in a more generic sense, I mean, as opposed to as, a, as it affects people generally. Um, First of all, I think it's appropriate to view maturation to be a process. And um, any process, if you ask yourself, well, what is a process? Then clearly a process is, a, is an incremental move between a beginning and an end. So if you think about a metabolic process, for instance, a metabolic process moves from a beginning in stages to an end. So it is an administrative process or a production process. Now, if we view maturation as a process, then clearly this process called maturation um, starts somewhere, and that's called birth, and it ends somewhere, and the point that it ends is death. And what's interesting about these two moments of birth and death is that they both have an unconditional character, because at birth, the infant has had nothing yet, so whatever the infant is going to get, it will still get, whereas at death, uh, you don't get anything, you give everything unconditionally. Although there's a challenge to that, a very reasonable challenge, and that is to say, listen, when I die, I don't give anything. Everything gets taken away from me. So then the question is, well, what's the difference between giving something and having it taken from you? And clearly that's got nothing to do with the event itself. I mean, uh, let's say you, have, you give somebody $500 because they're destitute, or $500 gets stolen from you. Now, the difference between the first experience of you giving the $500 and the second experience of it being taken from you doesn't sit in the $500. In other words, it's not in the objective event. It's in the intent of the person who's going through the experience. And clearly, if you consider the loss of the $500 to be like death, in other words, it's absolutely pred predictable it's going to happen, then it's the person who gave the $500 that, in a sense, had the successful experience, which means, by definition, the process of maturation is concerned with the process of the maturation of intent to give unconditionally. Now, this process is, as we said, it's a moment-by-moment -moment process. So if you consider, you know, how we are, if this is me on top of a mountaintop, kind of typically bemused and confused, being faced by everything that isn't me, then from an intent point of view, I can either deal with the moment that confronts me from one of two points of view. I can either deal with it on the basis of what I'm getting from the world, or I can deal with it on the basis of what I'm giving to the world. What changes as I mature is the degree to which I would either deal with the moment on the basis of what I'm getting, or on the, on the basis of what I'm giving. So, if, like if, I'm, if I'm comparatively immature, then more frequently than not, I'll, I'll, I'll give attention to what I'm getting. I'd give attention to what sits here. Whereas if I'm comparatively mature, then more frequently than not, I'll give attention to what I'm giving to what sits here. Now, <clears throat> we can therefore conclude that the process of maturation is concerned with the process of the maturation of the intent to give unconditionally. The more unconditional you are about what you're contributing or giving, the more mature you are. This intent to give really gets presented to us in two broad categories. First of all, there's, 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 kind of, there's a kind category, which really has to do with a sort of a, a generosity of spirit. And what, I'm, what I mean to say about this is that an immature person, when an immature person walks into a situation, they'll then generally deal with that situation on the basis of their own expectations, what they want to get out of the situation. Whereas a mature person would walk into exactly the same situation and they won't ask themselves what I want to get you, but they'd say, how can I help? What can I give? Now, as a result, we experience immature people and mature people quite differently. I mean, an immature person, in the first instance, um, when they find it very difficult to give attention to somebody else's agenda. You must have had the experience in your life where you're trying to explain something to somebody and they've answered you back before you finish speaking. And that's a miserable experience. And what that's saying is that, that while you were trying to explain something to them, they were giving attention to their own agenda rather than yours. Listening means that they are able to suspend their agenda to give attention to your agenda. Um, now, 
If I've not learned the skill of suspending my agenda for the agenda of the other in the situation that I'm in, then it means that when somebody deals with me, they'll experience me as being purely subjective because my agenda sits in my subject, which means they'll experience me as being irrational, emotional, judgmental, narrow-minded, conservative, etc., etc. When I suspend my agenda for the agenda of the other in the situation that I'm in, because my agenda sits in the other person's object, that person will experience me as objective, as rational, as reasonable, as open-minded, and so on. We have to understand that giving means being able to suspend your agenda for the agenda of the other in the situation that you're in. And very small little bits of behavior give away whether we have learned that skill or not, even a capacity like listening. The second thing that's true for the difference between immature and mature people is that an immature person basically views the situation in front of you on the basis of their own needs. Whereas a mature person would deal with exactly the same situation, not on the basis of what would satisfy them, what their needs are, but rather what is the appropriate thing to do, in a sense what the value that's operative in the situation. Now what I mean by this, for example, is to think about honesty as a value. Now if one asks oneself what does honesty mean, then clearly honesty has to have something to do with truthfulness. I mean, um, you... It, you know, any definition of honesty that, that doesn't relate to this idea of truthfulness would really not make sense. But if you ask somebody in what street he lived, and he told you he lived in, you know, Fred Street, you're not necessarily, because the person speaking the truth doesn't necessarily demonstrate that they're honest, because them speaking the truth about the street that they live in doesn't actually harm them at all. Whereas if you ask the person about something that could potentially harm their own interests, and they still speak the truth, um, you can now demonstrate that the person is honest. In other words, honesty means that you're able to, to act on the basis of what's the right thing to do in the situation that you're in, particularly in situations where it's not going to suit you to do so. So we'll find honest people, or sorry, rather mature people, being able to be courageous. They can take a bullet for things. They're not just expedient. They don't just act on the basis of what works for them. They act on the basis of what's right. And because this is the case, we find mature people to be fundamentally trustworthy. If you consider somebody trustworthy, what you're really saying about that person is that they're responsible. You're saying that you believe that when that person is faced with a difference between what's expedient and what's right, they'll act on the basis of what's right. When you consider somebody to be untrustworthy, you're saying if this person is faced between the difference between what's expedient and what's right, they'll do what's expedient. You can't trust them, they're irresponsible which is why we experience immature people to be irresponsible and to blame the world and to have an external locus of control, and why we experience uh, mature people to be responsible, to be accountable, and to have a, an, 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 uh, an, an internal locus of control. In other words, in a sense, account for their good fortune or misfortune on the basis of what they're doing themselves and not blaming others. Which basically means to say that insofar as you are a courageous and generous human being, insofar as you're here to give, is the degree to which you are a mature human being. And the degree to which these two things aren't true for you is the degree to which you're immature. Now, in a sense, why is it important to understand this? Because you have to understand that the end, at the end of this, uh, this process called maturation, there is an exam. And that exam is called the grave. In this examination, they only ask you one question, and that is, are you able to give or lose absolutely everything unconditionally right now? And you either pass or fail that exam. Now, if you don't spend your life studying for this exam, in other words, if you don't spend your life deliberately trying to act on the basis of what's appropriate, deliberately do what's the necessary, courageous, or generous thing that's appropriate in the moment that you're in, how do you propose to be able to f uh, pass that exam? Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum.